Welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm Show with Bob Preston. Bob is the president, owner, and broker of North County Property Group, the fastest growing and top ranked property management company in North County, San Diego. This podcast is for property owners and investors who are considering hiring a professional property management company to manage their property assets. You'll hear from leading professionals on the best practices surrounding the San Diego rental market, what's involved in successfully renting your property, and how to make sure your property is managed correctly. Now, here is your host, Bob Preston. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Property Management Brainstorm Podcast. I'm Bob Preston, your host of the show, broadcasting from our studio at North County Property Group in Del Mar, California. Today, we're going to talk about short-term rentals and the various moving parts that need to be managed with that class of rental property. As a longtime real estate agent, uh, myself and many other agents are familiar with the RealPage brand and software company. And lately, it seems like they're getting into a new, some new areas in terms of property management. And specifically, what we're talking about today is the managing of short-term rentals. And I have with me today, I telephone from Dallas, I believe, Matthew Hoffman of RealPage, and he is the head of short-term rentals for Kigo, which is a property management software for managing all those moving parts and details in short-term rentals. So thank you for joining us, Matt. Thank you very much for having me, Bob. So I already provided a brief introduction, but I'm sure I didn't do you and your company justice. So maybe we can kind of start by you telling us about yourself, your background, and what you do for RealPage and what Kigo is all about. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you very much for having me. I came into RealPage through acquisition. I've been in the uh, short-term rental or vacation rental space for about 10 years. Um, started a small business back in college on uh, doing essentially eBay for vacation rentals in a time where online booking you know, was not even existing yet in, uh, in the world of non hotel Right. Those are the days of putting up a sign and uh, putting an ad in the paper. And right, we've seen a lot of that in our community. That's right. You know, it did take you five days to hear back if the uh, unit was available or not before you can make a decision. Yep. So Kigo today is an enterprise level platform for short-term rental professionals. And, and it's really all designed around helping to tech enable uh, a lot of the manual processes that are involved in in this business, you know, you're in the world of long-term property management. You're doing one turn a year. You know, in this world, you're doing 17 a year on average. Yeah. And, you know, that is just a whole host of elements that define what a professional is in this space and delivering a hospitality experience that's similar to hotels, but has nuanced differences. And, and Kigo is a platform that helps uh, uh, professionals achieve that. Experience. Great. Well, full disclosure here, my company, North County Property Group, is a Kigo client. <laughs> and- All right. Yeah, and we've just come over from another property management software for the short-term rental side of things. You know, so for today's purposes, I know a lot about the short-term rental market, but with Kigo, I I know just enough to be dangerous because my marketing team did the implementation with your team. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask most of the questions and just kind of let you, you know, answer the questions and educate our audience if that works for you. Yeah, I'm at your service. Go ahead. Okay. So let's start with what is a short-term rental? I, I know you know this probably down cold, but I think for the audience, it would be important to differentiate. How are we defining this? I often intermix with the term vacation rentals. So I don't know if there's a reason I noticed you guys try to stick, I think, to short-term rentals, but I'd love to hear your definition of it. And then maybe I can share some of my thoughts. Absolutely. So the short-term rental is an umbrella term for a variety of different uh, names or nomenclature to define you know, the business model. Uh, in Europe, you've got villas and holiday homes. In the US, you have vacation rentals. Short-term rental, I look at as a, a non-hotel accommodation. It's being rented for one night or multiple nights, but always less than 30 nights. Right. Okay, good. And typically would be furnished, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Our, important topic for somebody who's thinking about renting, and we're going to get into this a little bit. I mean, I get a lot of owners who have these properties coming to me like, well, I'm thinking about a short-term rental, but maybe I should do it long-term. What's the difference? So you look at an accommodation type as being equivalent to what you get in a hotel suite. I mean, it's additional space. Right, uh, more often uh, there's additional bedrooms, and it's a it's a home away from home, uh, so to speak. And uh, you know that is something that if the service layer and the convenience that you get with a hotel can be achieved in something like a short term rental, 
then you'll start to see that the guests or travelers will find more value uh, understanding that the uh, economics are usually uh, in line with that of at least in urban markets. Right. And, you know, not only were the vacation rentals or the short term rentals typically furnished, but all the amenities, the the utilities, the ca- you know, cable TV, uh, Wi-Fi, all this kind of stuff is kind of rolled up into one offer for the stay. And of course, you know, with short term rentals, uh, the owners have to be willing to invest in all the various amenities that are provided with that short term rental. That's a good point it's between a host you know, and then a professional. You know, as a host would allow someone, uh, not by intention, but to go in and understand, you know, what is the Wi-Fi password? Is there somewhere I can go to actually get that information? A professional would have a printout and or, you know, some communication. Mm -hmm. So so you must study the market data. What do you consider to be kind of the average day in a short-term rental? You you rattle off, you know, one night, a week, you know, anything less than 30 days. What do you think is a typical stay? So it's important to understand off the bat, there are... Uh, what we call urban markets and vacation markets, right? Urban markets, you have consistent demand throughout the year versus seasonal demand in vacation markets. And then what you'll then have to look at is where did the guest originate from? So depending on where your demand is coming, you know, home away, booking.com, Airbnb, you know, that'll largely depict the type of guests you're going to receive. Vacation markets, uh, averaging a longer length of stay uh, in the U.S., about, uh, let's just say, five and a half to six nights per booking, and then in urban markets, a significantly shorter stay in the U.S., uh, averaging around, uh, let's say, three three nights per stay. Oh, that's interesting. So in urban markets, maybe you have people dropping into town, not dropping into town, but maybe staying for a, a business meeting or, or a shorter duration, perhaps? I don't know. No, that's, that's exactly right. So the, the proximity between the booking origination and the check-in date is typically less than 30 days for urban markets and in vacation-based markets, you know that uh, guest or traveler is making that decision three months out uh, and making that first payment towards. Right, and we're coastal San Diego. You may be familiar with the area. I don't know, but I mean, it's a very popular vacation destination, and also, believe it or not, during the winter. So we have a lot of what we call snowbirds coming in during the winter. Maybe people from Canada or cold weather states. But they want to come in and they want to stay for maybe two, three months, maybe the entire winter. So that is not uncommon in our uh, portfolio, which is kind of a nice complement to our long-term rental side uh, as well. And one thing I've noticed, Matt, is that some property management companies I know, they will not even go near short-term rentals and furnished rentals. I mean, they, they kind of avoid it, you know, like the plague, right? Why? I don't know. That's a really good question. And that's, I guess, what I want to talk about. We see it as a terrific complement to our business. We have the staff in place. We're used to managing properties. Yes, short-term rentals for us is a completely different business model because of all those kind of moving parts that are involved. And we need a separate platform. That's why we hired Kigo. But have you talked to many people who sort of have that attitude or you're trying to convince that, gee, maybe you should, uh, maybe you should consider this? Yes, we have. So uh, whether it be a multifamily, uh, single family, anyone that is managing units and has available uh, available space or capacity that's underutilized should absolutely consider all the ways in which to drive occupancy, right? And so the economics are the first thing I find uh, professionals look at in the world of a short-term rental you know, model. You look at as an owner, I say, hey, I've got a, a long-term resident who paying me $2,000 a month. Or if I convert over to a short-term rental, I can get you know, $200 a night and have a nice I have to book to, to obviously supersede that. Now, on the flip side, there's additional cost to support the model. Right. But if you're in a market like San Diego, uh, where to your point, you know, you've got seasonal demand uh, in ebbs and flows, but for the most part throughout the entire year, um, you know, that's a, why would you not uh, have a, a unit convert over to this versus sitting there empty and generating no income? Correct. Yeah, we... And you know, we have a lot of people who have second homes here, and that's a perfect candidate because when they're not staying at the second home, they would love to get some rental income off of it. So that is a big opportunity. I'll just throw that out there, right? Uh, our homeowners with second or third homes, the the data is not. I wouldn't say it's absolutely accurate, but I will tell you that a large portion of what we'll call the total addressable market for short term rentals. And with the growth of uh, this industry year over year, it's going to be interesting to see the amount of homeowners out there who simply just don't have anyone renting their second home, 
when they're not there. And if they could work with a professional, they could actually bring in, you know, income during that period of time. Right. Uh, that is absolutely a very real opportunity this year. We think there's probably a couple million uh, second home uh, units or homes, if you will, and owners out there that are not currently participating in a short-term rental pool or having it rented at all. Yep. What do you What do you think is the best or the ideal profile for a property owner who wants to do short-term rentals? Do, do, have you ever thought about that? I mean, is there a uh, sort of, I guess, your target market is companies like North County Property Group, but if you were to suggest what our target market should be, what would that what would that individual like? How would you describe that individual? So uh, you're right. That what is the the persona of guests you're looking to have, and, and what are they looking for? So um, you know, in I like a, that word persona. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, the, it's a little bit better than profile. I don't like to there, be there somebody. You go. persona, right? So persona is me. I'm a business traveler, and I'm coming to San Diego for a couple of nights, and uh, perhaps that means that I'm looking for something downtown. Uh, something that uh, can accommodate me for uh, maybe a longer stay than a couple of nights where I want some of the amenities of home. Uh, but uh, you would then maybe have something that was located downtown that is more in line with what you see uh, in, a, in a hotel, right? In a multifamily building. Uh, if it's a, a vacation market, then you're looking for perhaps families who are planning to come there uh, you know, during that peak time of year. And you want to be able to then say, okay, that persona who's coming on vacation is the core inside my home or the amenities uh, you know, a, a pool, certain things like that. Is it going to cater towards that type of an experience that, you know, that guest is after? And and really it comes down to understanding where you're bringing in the guests from. So if you look at a platform such as HomeAway or VRBO, uh, you're going to get a, a large aggregation of, of travelers who are looking for uh, you know, Airbnb, booking.com. You're going to find a lot more variety of traveler uh, that's looking for maybe corporate stays, you're traveling on business, things of that nature. So you know, understanding the persona that you're uh, you're aligning with or going after for your market is important in how you decorate the market. That's a really good description of the sort of vacation renter or the, the person who's traveling to stay in one of our properties. I couldn't agree with you more. What about the owner profile though, the owner of the property? What, do you guys study that at all? And sort of the ideal situation when, like if you were talking to a buddy or a friend of yours and said, hey, I'm thinking about renting my home. And he kind of started to describe his needs and what he was looking to do. Is there something, you know, are there any buzzwords or anything you'd look for to say, hey man, you should be uh, short-term renting? Yeah, I would say, I would first start by saying to homeowners out there that uh, professional short-term rental companies in the space today, effective owner acquisition strategies or you know marketing out to those homeowners to interest them in converting their home to a short-term rental is an effort that has been lagging behind right is you know they, they want to be able to find as as many units or homes they can bring in as they can assuming that they have the demand to fulfill that but it's a real challenge so i would say if i'm a homeowner and i want to know you know what is the how can I maximize the conversion potential or income generation for my second home? What would I do? I would go and literally use vacation rental or, or short-term rental management companies and just go on Google and look for those companies that have a very good online presence with their own storefront or website, right? That brand that you carry is a really good indicator at how they're managing themselves online, right? That's It doesn't have to be Hilton or Marriott, you know, and then you can work with that company that, can then come in and do an evaluation and help you understand you maybe where some areas of improvement would be. And if the home that you have now is immediately available to market and generate demand, or if there's some improvements that have to happen, what that cost would look like, and you know maybe what that market can do in terms of the payback. Typically, in a market like San Diego, you know even 10k in improvements, you know you could generate an ROI back on that in 30. Turn it back pretty quickly for yeah. sure. Yeah, I I get a lot of. Uh, potential or prospective clients calling into our office, and I think I mentioned this earlier in our in our episode here, and they're trying to figure out what to do. Should they go short term? Should they go long term? And they're kind of weighing the disadvantages and advantages. And so I became so familiar with this conversation that I actually posted a blog post about it and said, you know, short term or long term, which way do I go? And I kind of the first question I ask when somebody's uh, considering short term is is look, is this a second home that you use and want to use on a periodic basis? And are you, you know, do you actually live in another city? That's okay. a good if they answer yes, okay, that one's checked, right? And then, yeah, I mean, more of a personal enjoyment. 
And then it's like, okay, how important is a rental income to you? Is it, is it critical to your survival or lifestyle? Or is your goal a nice to have that if you generate some income off of your second home, yeah, wouldn't that be great? And maybe that would have allowed me to afford to take more time off or do some other improvements on the home. And if they answer the latter, then okay, check that one's more. And then, you know, what are your cash resources, right? So I kind of get into what you call the persona. You know, if you are willing to do that, willing to take on a little bit more risk, I mean, it is a little bit more risky of a venture because people are coming in and out of your property, then short-term rentals are for you. I don't know if you kind of agree with that description. No, I mean, you have to understand the, uh, you, you in, in the world of short-term rentals, you've got two customers, you know, as a property management company, yes. you've got the owner, and then you've got the guest and yes. you are bringing them you know, into an accommodation experience that, you know, you're wanting to be a good one. And so knowing that a homeowner uh, is looking at this as supplemental income, not, uh, you know, primary income, you know, then that is a great way off the bat to then, you know, manage expectations and then uh, under promise or over deliver for them as a management company. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and those are, you know, in that scenario, I would look at then uh, depending on the mix uh, or the percentage as you would say of where their needs are, a market like San Diego, you mentioned, you know, they have snowbirds. Well, perhaps you can have a scenario where uh, for a portion of the year, you're renting out 30, 60 or 90 day stays, you know, when the average daily rate, you know, is lower Good point. over to a short term rental, uh, when you can maximize the economics in the high season. And so, um, you know, really what you're seeing uh, shifting in the space is this sort of notion around flexible living. And if it's furnished and you've already meeting sort of the prerequisites, right, that would qualify, then, you know, is it in line with my expectations? You know, is the information correct on the listing? And is the price, you know, obviously justify me moving forward? And I, I believe that a hybrid model is absolutely okay. And a company like can help facilitate that. Yeah, we've done that. In fact, you know, some of our some of our vacation rentals or short-term rentals, there we call them, we put them in that classification but they're actually in condo associations where there's a minimum of 30 days anyway, right? right? So technically in the state of California, I'm not sure how it is in Texas, but in the state of California, from a legal standpoint, that's still viewed as a long-term rental. So I have to explain then to clients that, okay, you're kind of in this gray area where we could market right. your property both ways. So in, in addition to putting it out through Kigo onto Airbnb and VRBO, we will also put it up on Zillow and Trulia and Realtor.com and all those kind of things. All right, great. That was a cool conversation. I always like talking to this about someone who knows the market and knows knows a lot about short-term rentals. So we, so we have that in common. Yeah, you're kind of speaking my language here. Okay, so short-term rentals are booming um, all across the country. And, and I know you do a lot of international business, so it seems like throughout the world as well. What would you attribute that to? I mean, what is the driving force behind the you know major expansion in short-term rentals? Great question. There are three challenges facing non-hotel accommodation short-term rentals today for professionals and or homeowners. But let's just kind of talk about you as the professional. Mm-hmm. Education, fragmentation, professionalization. Now, those are three big words, but you've got pockets of short-term rentals around the world that are operating differently, right, uh, than other areas. You book a, you know, for a long time, you book a short-term rental in Miami. Then you book one in San Francisco a month later, you could have two very different experiences, right? And so Absolutely. what does it actually mean to, to standardize a process? Well, hotels have done a great job over a long period of time refining what they define as hospitality. You know, uh, for short-term rentals, you know, the expectation of the guest, you know, it, it, it really starts there, right? And understanding, you know, is this something that is going to be as expected, as advertised, you know, or not. And for a lot, there's been some growing pains, let's just say, where technology and, and best practices and markets and regulatory compliance, you know, all these things have been impacting growth. And what you're starting to see now, when you talk about just short-term rentals are booming, you know, is really where the demand for this accommodation type has surpassed available supply in many U.S. markets. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that's really where I said the boom is happening is that there's just, there, you're seeing specifically urban markets where they're just wanting to get more supply available to meet the demand. Uh, and then you know, what you'll start to see over the course of the next two to three years is this convergence of supply types where you've got a short-term rental accommodation sitting right on, alongside a hotel accommodation. You know, on the backside, it's who's facilitating that service experience. You know, the, 
that's where we're trying to move the needle, right? Technology that helps drive uh, service delivery and meeting the expectations of the guest. Um, that's that's where we're at now. And you're starting to see this type of growth because more companies like you are seeing technology or adding that to this and are becoming flexible with the business practices and not being so rigid around it has to be short-term or has to be long-term efficiencies gained in, uh, in technology and innovation. Yeah, perfect. Um, do you see kind of the market's acceptance of this sharing economy as a factor? You know, you have like, I hardly ever take a taxi anymore. It's always, you know, I press my, get on my cell phone or my uh, mobile phone and I look, hire an Uber, you know, it's instant, right? And uh, isn't there some correlation there, not just with Uber, but maybe that's one of the aspects of Airbnb that's attractive. You know, today's day and age, you know, you can go on one of these maintenance websites or apps, you can get a plumber at your house, you know, within a half an hour. What do you, what do you think about that? Is that one of the factors? Yeah, so the share economy uh, you know, is a, a fundamental shift in mindset for, uh, let's just start with millennial generation here in the U.S. Right. Uh, that is, you know, my generation uh, is definitely uh, more inclined to convenience over ownership and, and really driving, you know, how do I just get to what I need the fastest, uh, you know, is absolutely something that is playing into accommodations. And Airbnb was the a big, the biggest driver for uh, the sharing economy uh, and being able to say, you know, I have a home and I'm not going to rent out my whole home, but I will absolutely rent out my second or third bedroom. And then what does that look like? And so those types of accommodations, uh, I would say it's important to delineate. You know, if you are a secondary homeowner and you're thinking about this, you know, the economics are, are best when you convert the entire home. But yep. if you're someone that, uh, you know, is a single or, you know, you've got available space or perhaps a, a mother-in-law suite on property or whatever the case may be, uh, you should absolutely look at which, which to monetize underutilized capacity or space. And that, that share economy just opens up another vertical for demand and income generation. Okay, so this has been a great conversation related to kind of the high-level stuff, you know, in the market and the description and who's doing what and how it's done. I'd like to get a little bit more into the details here. And here we'll be able to talk about maybe some of the features that Kigo offers. And I know Kigo uh, does not take on individual homeowners, but the process of what you guys do for companies like North County Property Group are managing all those moving parts. So let's jump into that a little bit. So... You know, in your mind, what are the biggies uh, for somebody who wants to rent there? And what, what are the various aspects that people should be paying attention to? People as a secondary homeowner or... Right. Yeah, yeah, somebody who wants to... I mean, I try to explain to people all the moving parts that are involved in this business. And there are a lot of them. Yeah. So what are the biggies in your mind? The biggies are that if I am a... Uh, and I do uh, have vacation rentals myself. Um, the first thing you have to understand is not to underestimate the communication demand. So uh, we're looking at instant gratification. We all want it. You know, I need my ride now. I want this now. But in hospitality uh, or travel, you've got a five-minute golden window uh, with which to really kind of respond, you know, and uh, or address things as they happen. And in this short-term rental industry, up until this point, you see a lot of communication that's required prior to booking, or prior to checking in, so then that's this you know understanding expectations and managing that you know demand on you is uh, is something that you know if you have a full time job and you're undertaking yeah so if you're an individual homeowner wanting to put your home on up on Airbnb you better be prepared to answer people quickly otherwise you're not going to get them. exactly right or else your performance will drop and all those other things and then you've got these scenario now where once they're in unit you know, assuming that you've provided a very transparent way with which they get information, understanding, you know, Wi-Fi, directions of where to go, other things of that nature, you've got the incidentals or mishaps that happen while someone else is staying in. And then it's your ability while they're on a stay to get somebody out there and turn that around or fix that problem quickly because they're not staying there for a long period of time. Right. If you a hotel and the water heater broke at a hotel, you're not going to wait around for a day you know, you're just going to go to another hotel room. And exactly. so you got to understand that, you know, should something go wrong, you know, you are then at a very real risk for a poor review. And, uh, and reviews are very important in travel in the world of short-term rentals, right? And so in any business they are. But in this scenario, it can be even more damaging because that could be a deterrent from that person that was then going to check in a couple of weeks later. So 
just the service level of the stay while they're there uh, is also a big deal. And then it's the constant remarketing and, and reaching back out to ensure that you know, the cost to continue to bring in the income or the demand you know, can be very high and can be very variable year one. But over time, you, know, you should be able to develop an experience or a brand that hopefully has you as rememberable. And they're coming back to you every single year uh, you know, as a return guest. And there's a lot of effort and work that has to go into that type of communication as well on the checkout side uh, that uh, I find is just, you know, ends up being underestimated by most who are getting into the space. One thing I find with uh, a lot of the homeowners of short-term rentals that come to us is that they kind of have a general idea of what the rental value might be on a nightly, a weekly, but it's typically anecdotal data like, oh, my neighbor told me he's killing it and charging <laughs> You know, six thousand dollars, and I'm, and I'm going. Hey, you know, I think the market value is more like three, and so there's right. this, this sort of negotiation takes place, and then they typically haven't really factored in. Well, okay, you you will get higher rates in the summer, but during the winter and fall, uh, probably not so much. So right. there's that challenge too, determining realistic rates, right, and then right. Uh, setting up all those different websites. My God, uh, VRBO, Airbnb, TripAdvisor. And figuring out each individual site if you're if you're basically posting them directly yourself. That's right. Tough undertaking. I would just say this to any homeowners out there who are listening: to, to take it easy on guys like Bob, because <laughs> you know you you've got an expectation of what you want to be able to charge per night, uh, and you maybe have gone on you know Home Away or another site out there, and you found some comp sets that are similar. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know it is an iterative scientific process. You know, as a heuristic business model of looking at kind of data, right, and revenue management, understanding, you know, when is the optimal price point to generate demand? When can I maximize my value? Right, that is a, that is a full-time job. And uh, I find that the homeowners out there uh, who are most successful are the ones that trust the management company they're working with. That Thank you. <laughs> right? Hey, listeners, all my clients, listen to this, man. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We, are, we have this, I want to put in as many dollars to the door as I possibly can. You know, trust me to do that, but let's not be so rigid around our requirements. Now, granted, I understand if I have a, you know, a higher, uh, you know, home that's a luxury home, you know, uh, and I don't want a group of, let's say, under 21 coming in on a bachelor party over the weekend, certain yes. things that we get, right? We have to be able to screen for that. But, you know, pricing flexibility, you know, and being able to analyze demand points and fluctuation throughout the course of the year is something they should absolutely put in the hands of a professional. If you look at hotels, you know, over the last 20 years, you see very volatile, you know, ADR or average daily rate and pricing. If you look at our industry, you really see this very flat line because, They've got this my high season rate, and then I got my shoulder season and my low season. And what does that even really mean anymore, right? You have to be able to understand how many units are available in the market. Is there a big event that's actually happening? I'm going to trust you, Bob, to know that because all the hotels are booked, I could probably get two times my average rate right now, you know, and I'm going to go ahead and allow you to charge that. And we're all going to share in the economics and the win when that happens. Yep. Right here in uh, Del Mar, for example, where we're located, we've got thoroughbred track. I don't know if you've heard of the Del Mar racetrack. Yes. And the thoroughbred season is typically from July to September, yes. which is also the peak vacation time. So the rates usually go way up during the... Right. So, so you said one thing, you kind of uh, made the analogy to hotels. And one of the differences I've seen, there's been this shift as of late for this industry of short-term rentals to become, or maybe try to behave more like the hotel or travel industry. Can you comment on that a bit? Do you, is that true? I see there's been a lot of comparison to hotels. In the U.S. specifically, it's because of the accommodation type that us travelers in the U.S. have been most accustomed to. If you go to Europe, you, know, you see that it's not really been about accommodation type. It was simply an accommodation, whether it be couch surfing, hostels, things of that nature. It's not... They weren't looking uh, in their mind for something specific. So now what you really see is, is in the advancement of the short-term rental industry is understanding what non-hotel hospitality looks like and, and really defining that for our space, knowing that you're not going to have all the conveniences perhaps of the hotel, but in what you relinquish on one side, you gain in the other side. With yeah, you get a kitchen. You get a kitchen, right? That's right. That's <laughs> and you get your own personal sometimes pool and hot tub, all these things that you wouldn't necessarily get from being in a hotel. Exactly. 
One of the things that uh, we were, and I'm going to admit this, we were probably slow to the table on is the notion what we've traditionally called yield management. Mm-hmm. And this is sort of a, a concept that was born out of hotel industry and maybe travel industry. You guys call it rate management. We've implemented impl- implemented it with Kigo. Some of our owners are having to warm up to the concept. So tell us about what that is in, in, in the nutshell and why it's important for short-term rental owners. Absolutely. So uh, let's just say revenue management. Revenue management concept, uh, I guess you have to quote me on this. I'm going to say it's British Airways uh, in the early 80s, late 70s. Uh, that uh, you know is looking at availability, right, and uh, figuring out ways with which to maximize you know the the actual unit price point during different fluctuations and periods of time. And so it's plainful, right? I mean, that's what they're trying to do. That's exactly right. And so you know, yield management uh, or Intellerate, you know, as a former user of your previous platform, I know that's where you're getting that vernacular from. Uh, you know, they were uh, really I got to give them credit, the first to uh, start to build out. Um, you know, customizable rate plans that uh, would analyze gaps in availability and figure out ways in which to place bookings that would come in based off of that. Uh, you know, there's been a, um, a notion, the short-term rental vacational space for a long time where they've got, you know, minimum stay requirements during times of the year, right? Seven night minimum stay during this time of year, or 30 night minimum stay this time of year. But if you could get the same rate for a 15 night stay, why would you not simply allow someone to stay for 15 nights? So, so I, I say rate management because it's, it's not just the rate. It's also looking at achieving the goal that you're after and understanding that if there's a three-night minimum, but someone's willing to just book for one night at perhaps that same rate that they would for three nights, allowing that to happen, knowing that the economics of the model all the way through to facilitating a clean rate right, are facilitated. Uh, and, and now what we're starting to see is you know, you can look at now these flexible rules, flexible cancellation policies and say, if I'm going to allow someone, if it's to your point, the season where they're racing uh, in, in Del Mar, you look at it and say, how many days prior to check-in is this person looking to book? If they're looking to book within three days, well, they're clearly, right, uh, it's a last-minute traveler where we should maximize the rate, you know, a certain percentage, right? Maybe it's 2x or 3x that time period. But it's, you know, your overall portfolio performance is below a certain occupancy where you want to be on the year, then maybe you're more flexible the further out they're looking to book. But this is a science that's really evolving uh, uh, very much so for our space. And I think you'll start to see a, a convergence of uh, hotel revenue management uh, or airline revenue management sophistication around that for these types of accommodations in the company. Yeah, I, the, the thing that I like about your solution is that it the we have a ba- we ha- we establish with each other what we call a base rate and i don't know if this is the proper vernacular but that's what we call it oh yeah base rate yeah and so then uh, we say to the owner okay you know if your unit is booked to a very high occupancy during the forthcoming period then you know what we're not going to discount it very much because it shows that your unit is in high demand but if you don't have high occupancy, say for the month of July or March or whatever that might be, and we're getting close to that date, say within a week, what the heck, you know, we should, we should start getting this unit booked. And so yeah. one of our taglines is maximizing your rental value and income. And that's like our goal as a company, our, our objective. And so, I, you know, it, it takes a little bit of educating, educating the owners, but once they understand it, Typically, they'll agree to, okay, let's try it, see what happens, and then we'll reevaluate after certain period of time. Yeah, that's right. That, that is where that uh, statement I made to be flexible uh, and trusting you know, in, uh, in the professional that you're working with to manage your home you know, is really important. And it doesn't mean that just because you're being more flexible around the rules that you're sacrificing on the screen or the type of guests you're putting in there. You're simply just allowing you to maximize that conversion potential, if you will, or occupancy and income. Uh, by having that type of a strategy. And I'll tell you with our tool, um, you know, it absolutely will serve exactly that purpose and strategy for you where it's limited and where we need to make some additional innovation is to then start to analyze comp set data and markets. So it's beyond just the existing portfolio performance and is a holistic performance of similar comp sets of units in market to then make a predictable analysis and suggest to you what that optimal price point would be. You know, and that is something that we absolutely 
are aware of and are going to be addressing. And that's when you'll start to see that evolve, where it's taking in market data, not just the data inside the existing one of the things I want to jump into, and I'm going to skip around here and move ahead a little bit because I know we're up against a, a time crunch. For us, it, be, it became super challenging, as I described to you before we even started the webinar or the um, podcast, the whole notion of all these disparate sites, Airbnb, VRBO, TripAdvisor, and getting everything to be right on those sites as you try to communicate your rent rate, your photographs, your cleaning deposit, you know, all the, all the charge, all its charges and fees, you know, the security deposit, what, uh, damage protection insurance, if you have it. And so I think in more recent years, this notion of a of channel management management has become a, a big deal. We use Kigo for both our property management software and we use your channel management module. Can you touch on channel management, what it is and why it's so important in today's market? Absolutely. So uh, first and foremost, all the scenarios or pain points, I would say, that you just mentioned, yes. connectivity to these different channels, you know, there, there isn't, uh, in, in the world of multifamily or you know, long-term property management, they have like a mid standard where they've all, you know, we've agreed upon you know, what we're going to call a menu, for example. Like in this space, you have a challenge. Is it a, is it a hot tub? Is it a jacuzzi? Is it a whirlpool? Is it a spa? I mean, what, those are all variations of the same thing. That They're defined it, differently depending upon who you're talking to or where where it's posted. Exactly. That's exactly right. You know, and now I've got this very strong selling feature because I've got a whirlpool or a jacuzzi out on the back balcony overlooking the water that uh, I have labeled as a spa, and now that doesn't map over to the channel because they're not accepting that amenity set mapping to be the same thing. And now, as a result, my listing is missing the one of the strongest selling points that I have with my unit. Because of that one thing. And so this is the world that we are living in. Like a king bed. We were talking about that That's story exactly before right. we started yeah. the, the podcast. 100%. So what, you were joining us at a time that is fortuitous because we've had a one-size-fits-all approach to the syndication, but it's been laden with challenges just like the one that I mentioned. And now what we've done is we've built a technology platform for a little bit of a shameless plug that allows you to then now articulate and understand you know, what your listing will look like on each individual channel and then build out a strategy based on that channel and how they work because there are, there are hotel-based channels as Booking.com and Expedia and there are, are, are short-term rental-centric ones like a HomeAway and a Airbnb. And uh, it's important to know the differences. Uh, it's also important to understand that each one of them operates a little bit differently. Customer acquisition really? They have different booking fees, right? I mean, just to, for one that's the, probably the most uh, important to a homeowner to understand is all these different sites charge different when they take a booking. That's so exactly they're... right. And, and, and variable customer acquisition costs is difficult for this space or really anyone to consume. It's like a, it's like a variable mortgage, right? I mean, a fixed uh, at the end of the day, and you yeah. just know what you're going to pay. Uh, but in this scenario, you can now uh, create a strategy, understand the type of persona each of these channels are going to bring to you, understanding what they're going to charge you. And now we allow you to then craft what's acceptable to maximize the benefits of that channel, but minimize some of the downside risk of things such as you're talking about there, where you've got fee compression on cleaning fees or taxes and things of that nature. That can now be done with this. So you can maximize the upside, also protecting the business rules that you have and the expectations that you've set in place with your owners. Perfect. I use the description for channel management because people generally understand it, the layman, I kind of call it middleware, right? And I don't know if you, you like that or you appreciate that term, but... It's remediation, right? It is a connectivity layer between two points, Exactly. Right? So we have the property management software where we kind of put in the raw data. This is how I explain it to a homeowner. Your photos, your, your base rates, your property description, all the amenities. And then we have this really cool, and that's Kigo also. Mm-hmm. So that, that's a, kind of a plug for right. you guys. And then there's this channel management layer. Also, we use Kigo for that. Not all property management softwares in this market have that. And then you guys kind of normalize the data. Yes. You translate it, so to speak, to go out to Airbnb, VRBO, all these different bookings.com, all these different sites, which for us, I mean, it's so refreshing to have that kind of built in. And that's what shows you what your listing is going to look like on that channel before you even connect it to the channel. So you can understand and set the expectations with your owner about what that's going to look like. And I would just say this, the, the, the quality demand channels out there are responsible for 80% of demand 
Booking.com, Expedia, HomeAway, Airbnb, and and the professionals in those companies are working very hard uh, to attack and address the same challenges that I just mentioned. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of collaboration here at Kigo uh, in the last year with these partners, more so than we ever have before. And it's refreshing to, to see that even though they're competitors to some degree, they still are identifying these same symptoms that we're all being impacted by and are working collaboratively in ways with a technology partner like Kigo to address those. I can tell you, Matt, uh, I, I told you this before we started the episode today that we were having challenges with our previous property management software. And so in Q4, we evaluated, we looked at all the alternatives. I mean, you name it, you know, if you rattle a name off, I can tell you we looked at it. And we, cliff notes. Yeah, right. And I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you about it later. I can give you some good competitive yeah. info. We probably received demos from about eight. Wow. And, and I will tell you that the Kigo demo blew us away. I mean, thank you. The guy who did the demo was excellent, really good. He knew his stuff. It just was simple to understand. It was, you could tell it was easy to navigate through the software, very intuitive. And right away, we were kind of, we ended the meeting, we we're kind of like, okay, I think we found our partner, right? I mean, that's kind of how uh, much we were impacted by the demo. So congratulations on that. You've got a good team behind you. And yes. here's the bonus. We, we got it up and running in about 30 days. So <laughs> listen, uh, there is a, I see this talked about in our space a lot and blogs, LinkedIn, you know, VRM Intel, you know, typically you see implementations lasting six months. Uh, and the, the truth of the matter is, is that, uh, there's a phase for getting you all the data in place to actually execute the business. And then there's another phase for adopting the technology to your business or relinquishing practices maybe you've had to adopt the technology. It is a separate phase. And you know, there, we have areas with which we're building uh, upon to improve. But uh, I think from a sales perspective, your experience is uh, tied back to we're running our own property management company you know, for our, uh, we call it the real page suites. And uh, we, we are living in the shoes of the customer that we're building technology for. And all the professionals that are coming into Kigo have to spend time operating as a professional manager to understand what that's like. And it also allows us to look in the mirror and uh, see where we maybe need to, to improve upon as well. So I'm very happy you had a good experience. I get kind of excited and I geek out a little bit when I have this type of conversation. Today's been wonderful. I really appreciate your time. And so we do need to wrap up now. It's been filled with lots of great information. Do you have any last thoughts or comments before we conclude? Yeah. The, the last comment I would say is if you are a homeowner that has a secondary home that is unrented, uh, in the same way that Bob did his due diligence around technology providers, shop around for what you would determine as a professional short-term rental company, someone that already has short-term rentals in their portfolio, or is, is already proven to be able to execute and deliver a great guest experience. So look at the review that their guests are having on the properties they're managing that are short-term rentals and, and find someone that will represent your home well. But absolutely don't let the fear out there or, or anxiety around uncertainty stop you from getting into this space because there is a lot of opportunity available for those that are willing to get in at this point in time. Really great. And if someone wanted to get in touch with the team at Kigo, how would they do that? What would be the best way, best way to find you guys? They go to Kigo.net and you will see right on the initial homepage, it says a uh, platform for professional vacation rental or short-term rental managers. And you just click the contact us right there and submit your information and someone on our sales team will reach out. Okay. And if anybody was interested or needed further information on Kigo, feel free to call me at North County Property Group. Happy to give the reference and tell you what I know about Kigo. And so far, we're really impressed. Awesome. Matthew, thank you so much for taking the time to join the show today. Appreciate you being on as a guest. Hey, Bob, listen, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. That concludes today's episode. Thank you to all of our listeners for joining the Property Management Brainstorm podcast. Until next time, we will be in the field working hard for all of our clients to maximize their property value and rental income and maintain top renter relations. And we'll see you next time.